modern agriculture has got big difficulties, but one of the ones that is usually ignored is the farmer. My neighbors are the best people on the planet. They want to do the best things that they possibly can, but the fact is they're trapped in beans and corn. It's the only option anyone gives them. You know, they cannot change to growing pumpkins. They cannot change to growing apples, which is not what feeds the world anyway. Apple, the world is fed by rice, corn, wheat, cassava. Uh, it, they don't have any options. So they critical thing, and I determined this at the outset, we have to give the real farmers, the corn and bean farmers, a different system, a different crop that they can adopt. And with the hazels, we really think it's, it's there, although we haven't done the full-scale demonstrations yet. We've done all the initial demonstrations, and the data shows that it will work. You're going to hire somebody to plant it. You plant it once in your lifetime, once every 50 to 80 years. You're going to pick it with a machine that drives just like a combine. You're going to dry it in the corn dryer you have right now. That works. You're going to store it in the grain bin that you have right now, and you're going to take it down and sell it as a commodity at the elevator. We work with three crops. The hazels are the ones that are closest to real commercialization. Uh, chestnuts more closely resemble corn, maize, uh, than they do soybeans. The hazels are a drop-in replacement for soybeans. Uh, anything you can do industrially with the soybean, you can do with the hazelnut, and then quite a few things more. Uh, the uh, uh, chestnut would be a replacement for maize. It's more difficult to both to breed uh, and to uh, mechanize, but uh, we've made uh, dramatic progress there as well, and there's more to be done. And we have a third uh, crop now, which is a hybrid ha uh, hickory pecan, which we're growing in Minnesota. You can't, you can't grow pecans in Minnesota. They're not cold hardy there at all. But these hybrids grow, and there is a pecan industry in existence which uh, knows how to handle them uh, all very well. So there, again, we're trying not to get farmers locked into a single option uh, where they can get stuck. It potential is very real to scale this up uh, to uh, full production. We have hazels, which genetically, if you had a field that was operating at potential, we would be out producing soybeans now in Minnesota and, uh, and in other locations as well in terms of food. Uh, and uh, uh, more than that, in terms of oil, the, the hazel kernel is 60% uh, oil, and where the soybeans are 20% oil, and the oil is the exact chemical twin of olive oil. It's very healthy, very tasty. One of the startup markets is upscale uh, human consumption, so we're not talking about going straight to producing a biodiesel crop there, but you can. We've actually pressed raw hazel oil and poured it in our John Deere tractor with our John Deere uh, mechanics permission and it runs fine except it, does, it makes the exhaust smell much better. You don't plow ever. When you're growing soybeans you have to turn the ground over and the ground stays naked much of the time. Uh, with the hazels there is uh, habitat on the ground 365 days a year and there is an enormous root system. We've excavated the root systems on these things in order to understand how big they get. And uh, the, these are bushes, we have to understand. They, the hybrid hazels are bushes, not trees. Uh, much easier to machine, more human scale. And uh, the root systems go down at least 12 feet. There is a place here for creatures to live. We actually depend on complete biodiversity for the pest management. We put up raptor roosts to control the mice. We attract hawks, we attract owls, uh, we have uh, birds nesting in the bushes, birds eat the insects, 
Um, and we've been doing this for, uh, you know, as I say, almost 40 years, uh, keeping the data on it. And it was not a matter of uh, initial bias in this direction. I really expected that at some point, as a, you know, as a crop at high density, we were, you know, you're going to have to spray for something. But in fact, at this point, we've come to believe that uh, you had really, you don't have to, and you had better not, because if you do spray, you will knock your ecosystem back to zero. Uh, what we see now is every year there are new species showing up. We have frogs that not only eat insects all summer, but they're now hibernating in the trees, under the trees. They're there all year. Uh, we've got pileated woodpeckers flying into the uh, chestnuts and eating chestnuts. Um, uh, woodland uh, herbs are invading. We have may apples moving in. We have uh, Jack in the pulpits in the in the hazels that we didn't put there. They just show up on their own, and we they're fine. They're they're no threat to the crop. Uh, there that diversity helps. It always does. It's a very simple piece of ecology. The more species you have in a system, the more stable it is, and that is a is a demonstrable fact. It's really true. Uh, and you can rely on it. There are times, you know, if you have a new bug move in that eats leaves, you have to grit your teeth for a little bit of time. But what we found is over and over and over and over again, you know, a, a new bird will move in and eat it and knock it back down. And uh, the, the way to prove this to yourself is to walk outside and look around you. Uh, the world is green. The forest is green. Uh, they win these fights uh, in the long run. The first year that I really took these hazels seriously was 1988. We had extreme drought uh, where we are. My neighbor's corn got up to be four and five feet tall and was killed at that point. Uh, the hazels bore the crop that year with no irrigation, and they bore the crop the next year, which was really what perked my ears up. Uh, a couple of years later, 1992, we had the floods in Iowa, and we had you know major flooding all over the place, and we had reports of native hazel stands there, which is where we get our genetics that were under three feet of water all summer and bore hazelnuts on the part that was out of the water anyway, did not kill the plants. So we've seen them. Actually, on our farm, we've had 2,000-year floods in the last 10 years. Uh, we're, uh, Fillmore County was a, uh, an official federal disaster area this spring for flooding. We had massive damage, cut our, uh, our forest uh, drainage down to bedrock with the runoff from our neighbors' farms. Uh, but it it barely filled our farm pond up uh, at all uh, because they, they not only do you have these deep roots that uh, that take them through drought the the, the woody crops are essentially uh, in um, insensitive to <coughs> the, the kind <coughs> of uh, drought and rainfall patterns that will actually wipe out your other crops. Where we are in Minnesota, one-third of the corn ground did not get planted this year because it was too wet, too late, and too chilly. didn't make any difference to the hazels. We had uh, the, the heaviest hazel and, and chestnut and hickory crops we've ever had. The mess that we have as modern agriculture evolved under uh, a, a consistent threat, which was starvation. There was always this threat for the village. You know, if we don't grow a little more wheat or a little more corn this year, the village will starve. And so we went down this track of more and more intensive soil tillage under that threat. And uh, there was never really a time in history where we had a chance to pause and change it until now, we have so much food on this planet right now, we burn it. If you drive a car, you're burning food. There's ethanol in it that came from corn. Uh, the world is not hungry. People are not hungry and, and starve, which they emphatically do, uh, because we don't have enough food. They starve because we don't have enough justice and enough compassion. The, the reason we c probably cannot and should not uh, simply abandon row crop agriculture and all grow tomatoes in our backyard is called Chicago uh, and Cleveland and Boston and New York City. We've become an urban species and nobody sees that trend changing. We need to feed the cities or in fact our situation on the planet is going to get much, much uglier. 
uh, and uh, large-scale agriculture is what feeds the cities, and that's what we're trying to find a transition for large-scale farmers. The problem comes when you get to the really, really large-scale farms, and the, the, the danger there is that you then move into a corporate farmer model where, in fact, the, the, the person on the tractor does not own this land. Uh, he works under contract, and he doesn't care about the land the way a farmer who actually owns the place does or can. It's a, it's a trap that has been there many, many times before. The actual Dust Bowl uh, it was, it was partly caused by that kind of model. There were farmers who did not own, were required to produce, and the land suffers under that model. So when the driving force becomes profits only, you're in deadly danger of, of moving to a strip mining operation. There are a number of reasons why you'd rather grow bushes and trees for food than annuals. Uh, we already talked a little bit about holding onto the soil, uh, and they're, that's, they're very good at that. There are a couple of other things that are really kind of astounding. Uh, the, the woody tree the, or the bush has got its structure already there at the beginning of the season, and it gets the leaves out very early. You combine that along with there's even right now, uh, the stuff without leaves on it has got some photosynthesis going on under the bark. And they can capture at least three times as much sunlight per year. That means two things. At least three times as much energy is available to them per year compared to an annual crop. And at least three times as much carbon can be captured per year. So if you do the math on that, you find out that if you plant half of the world's annual croplands to woody perennials, you fix an extra 10 gigatons per year of carbon. Uh, to give you a background on that, right now our carbon deficit is about 9 gigatons per year. So this is a really big chunk of what's necessary to, to happen. Uh, since we're not turning the soil over all the time and we have this habitat, the soil is full of critters, including mice, and it turns out that the mice basically punch bathtub drains through the soil. So in the wintertime when you have thaws uh, and there's a little bit of water on top of the frost, there are these drains all over the field. The water runs down those. The mice are adapted to it, and we really feel that you know if, the, if we have a snowflake that falls, on our fields, it melts and it stays there in our soil because uh, because it's very fluffy uh, and uh, and actually has holes that penetrate the frost that way. The other thing that we uh, have seen and actually measured is the amount of soil building that goes on with these from the the soil that's captured from other fields that that are cultivated and blow away when you plow a corn or a bean field in the fall. The soil is exposed to the wind all winter and uh, the amount of uh, dust and soil lost that way is really uh, ferocious. The current uh, academics are finding that it's worse than they wanted to believe, worse than they had measured previously, uh, and it is a problem. And what we find, the hazels, of course, make perfect snow fence. They capture huge snow drifts, which melt very slowly and soak right in at their feet, but uh, it's very, very common for us to have a blizzard come in from the Dakotas and we'll go out and, and stick a shovel in our snow drifts and we'll hit a line where it's black. And it's from soil from the Dakotas that's now my soil. It blew off and we caught it and we, it stayed there. We actually build soil with these crops. We don't lose any at all. One of the major aspects to the woody crops is that the fossil fuel inputs required to maintain them are drastically, drastically lower. If you're growing corn or beans, you've got to plow the field every year. And you've seen the vast machines that they use to do this, and there, and there are so many of them. Places. We joke about the idea that John Deere may send out a hit man for me one of these days because most farmers are not going to need to own a tractor to grow the hazels. You're going to need to own a harvest machine, uh, but that's like the combine part of the equation, and they all own one of those anyway. But you're not tilling the ground ever again, and uh, you do need to control the grass in the early stages. We may mow that, but we actually got tired of paying for the diesel fuel and the machine time, 
and started playing around with uh, animals, poultry. Horses are a, a huge um, uh, amount of fun because they refuse to eat the hazel leaves unless they are absolutely starving. They will leave them alone and eat the grass right down to nothing and fertilize things a little bit in a, in a, a, a non-messy way as they go. Uh, but uh, not only that, but the uh, people don't think about it, but the pesticides that we use are actually all fossil fuel based as well. And we don't need any, not only don't use any, we don't need any. So we haven't been able to actually calculate what the difference is in a, in a, uh, a sensible way, but it's, it's very, very large. No plow, no pesticides, that's fossil fuel carbon. My own back hill, according to the 1950s USDA soil survey, there should have been 18 inches of black prairie topsoil all over this 50-acre hill. And by the time I purchased the farm in the mid-70s, it was mostly gone. There was zero to six inches of soil. And this is the history of row crop agriculture. It was invented where? In Mesopotamia, please. And we have been fighting wars there that we name deserts desert storm. Uh, agriculture turns countries into deserts. Uh, North Africa was the wheat basket for Imperial Rome, and it, it's not anymore. Uh, they, they exhausted it. It may have been one of the reasons why Rome fell. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, uh, we're strip mining the soil with annual agriculture. And the woody plants are what build it. We know that too. Forests build soil. And that's the model that we're aiming at.